All of my life, one of my favorite superheroes has always been Spider-Man. While I may not have been the biggest into superhero comics growing up, favoring manga as my reading of choice, Sam Raimi's first Spider-Man film changed my life as a kid. Believing in this character is not only him finding himself to understand what it means to be a hero, having great responsibility coming with that great power, but also seeing the human side through Peter Parker's life. Throughout the rest of my life since, Spider-Man media from the video games, cartoons, and every other movie adaptation has had my attention. One of the cartoons that came out for the Web Slinger always stuck in my brain though as in comparison to all of the other series that have been made. One of these things was not like the other, as 20 years ago in 2003, MTV of all places would deliver a short-lived CG animated series called Spider-Man The New Animated Series. I just love when properties put new in the title. Without it, how would I ever know? Now, like I said, this series was short-lived, only ever having 13 episodes released before it came to an end. But thanks to having less restrictions of what could be done in the show since it's on MTV, the show offered a bit more mature and toned spirit to it all that makes it extremely fascinating to revisit. Today, let's take a look at Spider-Man the new animated series, see what it's all about, and what happened to it in the end. Welcome back to the 25 Days of Fringe Miss, where there's going to be brand- Wait, 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 wait. Uh-uh. Ah. Double Fringe Miss. Aw, you only thought you were gonna get 25 videos this year? Look at you. You look silly. But I'm here to fix that because I'm going to give you not only 25 videos, but I'm giving you 50 videos. I have two channels. That's two Fringe Misses. Each day there'll be a brand new video on both channels for 25 days. I haven't slept in months. Enjoy the content. Or don't. Spider-Man The New Animated Series premiered on MTV July 11th, 2003. While clearly the show would go on to disconnect from the Sam Raimi world as the years after the show we would get the sequel movies to the original film, while this show took its own path. But this show would build off the original Sam Raimi Spider-Man film by following Peter Parker, Mary Jane Watson, and Harry Osborn as they now would be a little older and attending Empire State University. Through this, we follow Peter as he has to navigate still being a person with his school responsibilities, working on building his relationship with Mary Jane, holding down a job, being a friend to Harry, all while continuing the exploration of what being a superhero is truly about. Of course, there are a lot of loose threads that come from what happened in the original film that get explored here as well, mainly that Harry is still dealing with the death of his father and is still blaming Spider-Man for it. While the show builds up its own story and direction based on the material that came before, things could have been way different. In the conception of the show, it was planned to be a direct adaptation of Brian Michael Bendis's ultimate in Spider-Man comic, with Brian himself working on the production to help develop what it would be like, translating it from the pages of a comic and into a show. Despite writing the pilot for this show, Sony, who at this point had the rights to Spider-Man when it comes to the film and television side of things after making a $7 million purchase from Marvel, but never used what Brian had written. And can I just add that it's crazy how little $7 million seems in comparison to the billions they've made on Spider-Man movies since over the past 20 plus years? But going back to what I was saying, why wouldn't they go with the pilot if the original plan was to adapt Ultimate Spider-Man and you had the creator of that working for you on it? Well, plans change. Especially when you're Sony and you just created the first Spider-Man movie that was met with immense praise and success. You start feeling like you should ride the train some more. Unfortunately, when things derail here, Spider-Man doesn't show up to stop the train. So the Spider-Man series would be reworked a bit, with Sony bringing on screenwriter and producer Morgan Grendel to develop what the show would be. While there were guidelines for some continuity's sake, and I mean that loosely, Morgan was allowed to come up with brand new characters that could make sense in the new setting and time in Peter Parker's life, which we will get to that here in a bit shortly. With this being the early 2000s, the medium of animation was starting to change with more shows making the jump from 2D to 3D thanks to the use of CG animation. If Spider-Man the new animated series was going to go this way, they might as well get the people responsible for making the first CG animated show created reboot to be the company producing the look and animation for the show, Mainframe Entertainment. <laughs> So why MTV? You're telling me music television wanted to have their own Spider-Man cartoon? Well, MTV was going through a weird transition, no longer just being the place where music videos live, but instead a place to find both real and allegedly not real reality TV. Their whole vibe was moving on to create a bunch of entertainment with one of their avenues being that they wanted to explore animation some more. So a deal was struck and MTV ordered the creation of a Spider-Man animated series, a new animated series. So sorry. I 
I really couldn't help myself. So it's interesting that this happened, but here we are. MTV is getting their own exclusive Spider-Man cartoon, and your new Peter Parker here, who was supposed to continue the version Tobey Maguire played, would now be voiced by Neil Patrick Harris. MTV is this middle ground weird choice in the way that the content the channel releases falls under the teen and young adult demographic. So while they could have a Spider-Man series that would be able to reflect that in the tone of the show a bit, MTV still wanted to have a bit of an olive branch to younger audiences since at the end of the day, it's still Spider-Man. So weird things happen behind the scenes for the production, like not having Aunt May be a part of the series, despite being an important figure in Peter's life. Apparently, MTV was worried that by having some form of elderly person presented in the show, that it wouldn't connect with the younger audience tuning in. And I don't really quite get that logic here. Like, the show's more violent, there's cursing, suggestive themes, but whatever. See you later, Aunt May, I guess. Aside from stuff like that, the show flowed fairly smoothly as MTV's more chill conditions led to more creative freedom to make the show. Even then, there were production delays that caused the biggest problem for the show's audience to follow along with, as episodes would be released in the wrong order, causing lots of confusion for what's going on. I mean, the first episode in order wasn't the first episode to release and bring you into the series, which is just probably not the smartest thing to do when launching a new show. The order of the episodes, using the numbers 1 through 13, were premiered in were 8, 4, 3, 5, 6, 7, 11, 10, 2, 1, 9, 12, and 13. So from mid-July until mid-September as the show premiered, it really made it difficult to follow the series. Now, thanks to the DVD release, you can enjoy them in the correct order. The series, in terms of what the episodes themselves offer, are pretty good, and do a great job at keeping you interested in the action, as there are some really well-done and artistically directed showdowns that are just so cool to witness. Peter's whole on-again, off-again thing with MJ is interesting in the fact that there is a clear difference between the two of them as Peter and MJ versus Spider-Man and MJ being together on the screen and having chemistry, but with how she's into Peter and kissing him one episode and then they aren't together in the next just made things mostly unclear for what their future or plans for their future really are, especially when we get introduced to the new character of Indira, or Indy for short. She's someone who comes into the series as a character specifically created for the show that works with Peter and has a real connection to him that feels a lot more real than Peter's and MJ's in the series. From this point on, it creates a larger dynamic between Peter and the two of them, and that's great and all for some of the drama, but Peter's relationship with Indy is so much more interesting. One, there is just so much more sexual tension between the two of them, with a ton of very suggestive comments or innuendos made that things always feel a bit too steamy, but other parts of the show feel this way too, so the whole show is pretty down bad. And then two, as Peter, they work together as he takes photos while she does her journalism work, but he also uses information he gets from her to secretly aid in his Spider-Man saving the day activities. I just found myself caring way more about them and their relationship over anything that had to do with MJ. This does come back around to something way more intense and engaging when we get to the end of the season with a set of two episodes titled Mind Games Part 1 and 2. This Double Fringe Miss is brought to you by Gamersups. What's the deal with Gamersups? I mean, it's less than a calorie, it has no sugar, but it tastes great, something's gotta give. But there is nothing to give. Scratch that. There is something to give. How do you like 10% off your order of gamer subs? Use code FRINGE and do it now. Please, it helps the channel. Do you want to do cool stuff next year? Do you want to make 2024 cool? You support gamer subs, you support me, and we're going to do big things. Link in the description. Use code FRINGE. 10% off. Do it as Peter is pushed to his ultimate limits here. As the series has shown us brand new villains that are created specifically for the show, the series comes to an end with two other brand new characters known as the Gaines Twins, as they have the ability to mess with Spider-Man's mind, thanks to their super psychic powers, leading to Peter seemingly getting over this and being unaffected, taking care of the twins and continuing on about his day. So as we move past that for now, Peter deals with both MJ and Indy as they pull the ultimatum card of making the hard decisions in life and picking one of them to pursue. He can't flow back and forth in how he feels day to day and have both of them, but from this, Peter decides to continue to pursue his interests in MJ, showing that he trusts her and reveals that he was Spider-Man this whole time. Then Craven the Hunter comes in and, you know, just straight up kills MJ. So that sucks. Uh, I wonder if Indy's still around. All of this ends up being revealed that the Gaines twins had corrupted his mind. This whole episode, for the most part, was just in his head and it didn't even happen. It was all a setup from the Gaines twins to have Peter believe that Craven killed MJ and 
and for him to then seek out deadly revenge and go after Craven, with the Gaines twins motivation of doing so based on Craven killing their parents. It's all pretty exciting and just a solid engaging story that was executed well in the way that it was told. As things continue on and Peter nearly kills Craven, he starts realizing something isn't right, now being able to pull back on hurting Craven and just capturing him for the authorities to deal with instead. From there, he teams up with Indy after he figures out that everything he had experienced wasn't reality and that MJ is actually kidnapped and held by the twins, going after them and actually saving MJ, leading to a final confrontation with the twins where he pushes one of them off the roof of a building, but then another surprise reveal happens as this was another messing of Spider-Man's mind, as in reality, he pushed Indy off nearly killing her. Because of that, it put her in a coma, and there's no guarantee that she will recover from this, and Peter now goes after the twins to finish taking care of them, as he then pushes back from the superhero life, retiring from being Spider-Man, putting the Spidey suit in a briefcase with some bricks, and then tossing it into the water, saying goodbye to being a superhero. It's pretty damn dark, honestly, and not only do we see Peter beating himself up over this, but the world around him is against Spider-Man. MJ lost faith in Spider-Man being the responsible good guy after literally witnessing him pushing Indy off the building. Harry still has a grudge against Spider-Man, and J. Jonah Jameson has just always hated him. And that's where it all ends. A dark, dreary, cliffhanger ending. <laughs> After 13 episodes, the season, and well, the series, was over. It had built up to this big moment of Peter having just gone through so much at the hands of the Gaines twins, giving up on his superhero life for the safety of those around him that he truly cares about, ending on an unresolved cliffhanger, which really, really gets under my skin when that happens, as now this lives on as its own spin-off universe of the show, since the events of the show don't fit within the continuity of Sam Raimi's second Spider-Man movie, which at that point would be fully announced and be coming out a year later in 2004. But why did did MTV pull the plug on the show though? There's kind of conflicting things said about it, with the basic explanation of the ratings weren't what MTV wanted to see. But what also is said is that the viewership wasn't that bad, and potentially MTV just didn't see the show fitting alongside the other programming. I feel it's a bit of both here. I agree that it doesn't fit with their other programming, but hey, they're the ones that ordered the show for production in the first place. I think that the episodes being out of order also led to viewer confusion and lack of interest. Heck, it could be the look of the show at the time that turned some viewers away. I mean, I think it looks pretty cool, if not sometimes pretty odd looking from the use of earlier CG animation, but I like the cell shaded rendering on top of the CG animation, as I feel it really makes the series look unique. And overall, the show had decent to mixed reviews. Some see it as an underrated gem that is at least worth a watch, but just knowing that the ending is a cliffhanger, and also will leave you pretty sad because it ends on a pretty dark note overall. Others think that since it all leads to nothing, that there isn't a point to what you get out of it as a viewer. There is a lot to like here in the show, in my opinion. Lots of cool artistic choices that give some great mood to the vibe of the show, and I like that it takes a decent amount of the plot points and setups from Sam Raimi's movie, but grows it out in a new way from there. The characters themselves don't exactly feel like they were really meant to be the continuations of the live-action film versions of themselves. Peter and MJ have this are-they-dating, are-they-not-dating romance drama that only gets more complicated thanks to the addition of Indy, and for this time in Peter's life and the setting he is in, I think all of that feels fine and more realistic here, that it didn't feel like a side thing for no reason to add a bit of extra romance in, or drama. There is a feeling of the villains showing up in the series being limited and held back, as aside from a handful of actual villains that are real, the series adds some new villains, like brand new bad guys that have inspirations from other villains or a mix of them, and this comes from the freedoms given to develop new characters. If the series were able to continue on, there were plans to have other villains make appearances like Vulture and Mysterio being brought into the mix, with Peter of course coming back to don the Spidey suit once more and continue on being Spider-Man. And I'm just curious how you kind of resolve everything that just happened. But sadly, that just never got to come to fruition. But it was really cool to see that Michael Clark Duncan reprises his role as Kingpin, in which he just played in live action in the same year's Daredevil movie. So maybe these worlds are connected. Or, or maybe it's like a multiverse thing. Oh, oh, or maybe it's... I I'm just kidding. I I'm not gonna do all that. Relax. I'm just here for what the show specifically offers. Even though the series has plenty of shortcomings, some hilarious weird animation and ends up leading nowhere, there are still some pretty surprising moments, some great action, and it ends up being a bit darker, edgier, and sometimes more violent than any of the other Spider-Man cartoons. But what are your thoughts on MTV's Spider-Man The New Animated Series? Were you a fan of what it had to offer? Let me know in the comments below. I've been Jordan Fringe, thanks so much for watching, like and subscribe, later.